Okay, so uh, welcome. My name is Angela Sider, and I'm one of the co um, chapter leaders with an organization called Parents for Children's Mental Health. And so we're a group of parents that um, provide supports and, and some services to other parents within the Waterloo region who are raising uh, children or youth that are struggling with some mental health or behavior challenges. And so we welcome you to this uh, joint presentation. It's with PCMH and the Waterloo Region uh, District School Board. And um, I just want to let you know I'm a parent of two children and uh, both that have a uh, struggle with some aspect of mental health. Um, I'll use uh, some examples as we go through the presentation tonight that hopefully make some of this content come alive for you. Um, but just wanted to give you a bit of a sense of kind of who we are. I have a counterpart as well. So my co-chapter uh, leader is Sharon Hutton, and she's probably been the one that's been in contact with you to set you up with registering for this webinar. Um, so she also does a lot of the work and she's been working really hard with all of our registrants for this webinar. So um, just she's not with us tonight, but I just wanted to let you know that she is also with PCMH. So now I'm going to pass it over to you, Laura. Hello, my name is Laura Bickle. I am a psychologist with the Waterloo Region District School Board. Uh, and I've been with the school board since I think about 2008, so quite a few years now. Uh, before that, I worked for preschool diagnostic and treatment services at Grand River Hospital. Um, and I am a mother of um, two teenage daughters, 17 and 18. Um, and I'm really pleased to have uh, all these participants here today. Over to you, Dave. Hi there, I'm Dave Clausen, uh, also a psychologist with the Waterloo Region District School Board. Uh, I've been there for almost 20 years um, and worked at a couple of places before that too. Um, two daughters as well, like Laura, mine are a bit older, they're in their 20s. Oh, and actually um, one thing, because this uh, is being recorded, you may wanna change your name to just your first name um, because if it shows up in the chat, it will identify you. So uh, if, if you're concerned about your privacy, please change your name to just your first name or, or just uh, whatever you want it to be. Hi there, my name is Tiffany Jell. I'm also a psychologist with the Waterloo Region District School Board. I've been there over 20 years actually and have only worked there. <laughs> so there you go. Um, I have two kids as well. I have a 10 year old boy and a 12 year old daughter. And so, Leading into our presentation, we're going to just set the stage a little bit. Um, I'm not sure about you, but during the pandemic, we've been doing a lot of cooking at home. Uh, and in particular, a lot of baking, a little bit of comfort food. Uh, and my kids, they like helping. And so what I found interesting is working with them in the kitchen is we've spent a lot of time talking about the tips and tricks and things that aren't listed in the recipe. So things like, you know, what order ingredients go in, any kind of tricks about measuring and making sure things are cooked well. Um, and so that's kind of how we think about this presentation. We are not going to give you a precise recipe that's going to work for every family in exactly the same way. But hopefully with the framework we're giving you, it will help you pick what you need to make your own family recipe, as it were. And I like the idea of the concepts and the flexibility so that as things change in your family, you can adapt to whatever your needs are at that time. Um, so hopefully this will be very helpful for you. Enjoy. There we go. So without further ado, um, if we are baking cookies, if Tiffany's baking cookies, what would be in every kind of cookie, including chocolate chip cookies and uh, any other kind of cookie you come up with, would be probably flour, butter, and sugar, I think. I baked some cookies, not a ton of cookies, but some. And I think what we're looking at in some ways tonight is the flour, butter, and sugar of parenting. That's, that's what we're doing. And we're gonna combine those in, in all kinds of different ways, hopefully to get you the outcomes that you want. So here they are, here are the, here are the three. The three things that matter in terms of parenting. Love, discipline, and competence. And competence is about the development of competence, helping your child become good at a whole bunch of different things. I want you to notice a couple of things about this triangle. Actually, first of all, if there's only one thing that you remember from this presentation, this is it. This is the triangle. This is the, the guts of it. This is what matters. A couple of things to notice. Um, 
hopefully you can see it. Love is in a bigger font and it's a bigger box. And there's a reason for that. Um, in terms of the ingredients, I don't know, I guess this would be the sugar, I'm not sure. Um, love is the most important one. This is, uh, is the central thing. The other things matter, but this is the biggest one. The other thing that you'll notice about um, the triangle is the lines with double arrows. And what that means is that all of these things influence each other. They all impact each other. So in some ways, when you're working on one, you're actually working in all of them, okay? So if you think about it for just a second, a child who's very competent, who's very good at something, probably doesn't need a lot of discipline and is probably very easy to connect with. Okay? A child who's easy to connect with is probably good at a bunch of things and is fairly self-disciplined. A child who's self-disciplined is probably fairly easy to connect with and is probably good at a bunch of things. Okay? All of these things interact. They all impact each other. If you think about it for just a second, each one of these gives a child a different message. The message when you, when you love your child, the message is you matter, you're important. The message from discipline is you can't do whatever you want. The message in competence is, so if you want to influence the world, here's how you do it. Okay. And so we're, we're trying to get our children to be able um, to understand all three of those different messages. All right. So why do we pick these three factors? And there are a bunch of different reasons. If you look across the psychological literature, these three things show up in all kinds of different areas and especially two of them. Love and competence run through all of the things listed here. So they run through motivation literature. They run through how we evaluate other people. They run through adult depression literature, resilience literature, and, and even status. What other people think of you is based on um, sort of these things, um, relationship, and competence. Discipline doesn't show up necessarily quite as often throughout these three. And I think there's an interesting reason for that. What we expect is that over time, discipline becomes internalized. Children do discipline themselves. The point of discipline is to become self-disciplined so nobody else has to do it for you, okay? And so discipline disappears to a certain extent because it becomes something that, that the child does themselves. One of the other main reasons that we pick these three things is that there are sort of three main parenting traditions and they align nicely with, uh, with each point on the triangle. Attachment theory focuses very much on love. Behaviorism focuses very much on discipline. And a more recent tradition, anybody who's read anything by Ross Green knows that he focuses very, very much on competence, on, on developing skills within the child. So, so it feels pretty comfortable to us that you know, this converges across a lot of different areas and it seems to fit pretty well. Also fits with our experience as parents. All right, so let's move on. We're gonna talk, um, we're gonna start with uh, the most important thing. We're gonna start with love. So why does it matter? Well, there are all kinds of reasons and I think a lot of them are obvious and some of them um, are actually a little bit surprising. When you look across the research literature there's better social functioning, there's better emotional functioning, there's better intellectual functioning, there's better mental health, there's better physical health. Um, and, and so all kinds of things happen. When you form a good connection with your child, all kinds of positive things happen. Let's chat just a little bit about attachment theory. Okay. And attachment theory is sort of the main theory that we have that talks about love and connection with a child. And attachment theory has a couple of, of main parts to it. Your child, according to attachment theory, has two basic needs. There's the need for a safe base from which you explore the world, and there's the need for comfort. And some people have described this actually as a circle. So your child's with you, they go out and explore, and then when something happens and they're not quite sure about it, they return, they receive comfort. As soon as they're good to go again, they go out and explore and this pattern repeats itself again and again and again and again, okay? So two main needs, comfort and soothing and a safe base from which to explore. Tiffany. I was ready for my example. Am I too early? 
Um, oh, hold on. Yeah, hang on for just a second. Okay. Um, one of the things that we know about these two needs is that um, people are usually more comfortable with one than the other. Okay, so if you think about yourself for just a second, some people like to hold their kids close and it's like, it's really nice here, so why don't you stay here? And other kids are like, come on, go, 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 get out there and do stuff. And, um, and that has to do with parental comfort. But the simple fact is your child has both needs, so we need to get good at both. And this is where Tiffany has an example. I think all of us have been at the playground and see this play out. So in my family, I was definitely the soother comforter who stayed really close and had lots of really great advice on what was safe. Whereas my husband took a bit of a step back and let that exploration happen with a little less involvement from the parent. Um, so that was a learning for me uh, that that was actually not because he didn't see safety as important, but he really understood that need for exploration and finding out what was safe for yourself um, and intervening when necessary. So what I want you guys to do actually is take just a second right now and think about it. Which one are you more comfortable with? Are you more comfortable with the soothing component? Or are you more comfortable with the exploration component? Because knowing that's really important because you need to be able to respond to the other one, the area of less comfort. And uh, um, so yeah, just think about that for a second. All right. Other elements of attachment that are really important. One of the central things is to be able to recognize what your child needs. Okay. So recognizing what do you need right now? Because it's not always immediately obvious. Often we know. It's often we know, okay, now you know you're you're crying, you need comfort. Okay, that makes sense. Or you know, you're wiggling to get off my lap. Okay, go explore. Um, so so we know that, but being attuned, noticing what's going on and noticing thoughts, feelings, and behaviors within your child are really, really, really important, okay? And in order to be attuned, you have to pay attention. And Laura's got a really good example on that one. And I just, I just wanna think about the, path, the, the last slide for a second. Um, it just occurred to me just now that, um, you know, when we think about those, that the need to explore and the need to, to soothe and comfort, we tend to think about that in the early years, but that never changes. You know, when I'm thinking about my own teenagers, there are times when they still actually need to be soothed when they break up with a boyfriend or they get a bad mark on a test. Um, and there are times where I need to let them explore. I need to let them take the car keys and drive to Toronto. And, you know, so that, that doesn't change. Um, and as far as attunement goes, you know, just trying to pay attention um, to, to what, that, what that child needs, what that teenager needs. Um, and, I, it was when we were doing this um, webinar with some staff in the spring that this idea of attunement, when Dave talked about it, I hadn't sort of really connected it with my real life. Um, but I realized that as we've all been working at home, um, you know, I'd be on my computer doing my emails, doing whatever. And when one of the elusive mystical uh, creatures of teenagers emerged from their bedroom, I'm still kind of like doing my emails and sort of half paying attention. And it wasn't until we were doing this webinar and Dave's talking about attunement that I'm like, oh my goodness, I've been missing this. They're actually coming to try to talk to me. <laughs> so from that point on, when they would emerge from their lair to come downstairs and they would talk to me, I would put everything aside and really engage with them. Um, and what I found was the rate at which they descended from their lair increased. And lo and behold, they started communicating with me and talking about me more, talking to me more. So this is an example of attunement, but it's also an example of, you know, even those of us that have been kind of working in this area for a long time, we miss things and we make mistakes and it's, it's normal. And we, but you know, once you get the information and you can start kind of thinking about these things, um, you know, you can start applying it to your real life. And it, attunement's hard because as parents, our attention is pulled in so many different directions it would be nice to just pay attention to your child all the time, but the simple fact is that you can't because there are so many other things to attend to. And um, there's there's a real trick to it. And um, Ange, I think you've got an example around some of that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, I was just gonna share uh, as well. So I my daughter uh, likes to come in, she seems to be energized later in the evening. So I'll be in bed and uh, 
uh, relaxing and maybe playing a game on my phone and she will come in and out of my room oh, I don't know, sometimes five, six times in the course of about half an hour to show me TikTok videos or YouTube videos that I'm particularly not that interested in. But um, it really is about that attunement, being able to uh, recognize what she needs in that moment. And so sometimes it's a Sometimes it's the last thing I want to do is watch a silly video that's probably been staged. Um, but for her, it's really funny and she really wants to share it with me. And that's what she needs in that moment. So I oftentimes put my phone down and I watch a video and giggle a little bit and engage with her over that because that's where she's at. And that's what she needs in that moment. Thanks. So, so again, you know, there's nothing wrong with being on your phone. But then putting it down when the time is right is super important, super important. Okay, so things to look out for in terms of forming a good relationship with, uh, with your child. We know a fair bit about even ratios of negative interactions to positive interactions. In order to keep a relationship positive, we need about a five to one ratio of positive to negative. And so if your relationship with your child starts to feel adversarial in some ways, if it feels like you're butting heads all the time, Chances are good. That's a direct result of a, of a ratio that's out of whack. You want to increase the positive interactions, exactly the thing that Ange is talking about. All right. Um, other things to watch out for. Sometimes um, our verbal behavior and our nonverbal behavior doesn't match. And that's a killer. That looks um, like it's not very genuine to other kids and, and kids, especially as they get older, pick up on that and, and, they're, and they're not very pleased about it. Um, I think Tiffany's got an example for us there. So you're probably all thinking about times when maybe you're not really smiling, but saying something positive. My example is actually the opposite. I was observing an interaction where the adult was super sweet and so smiling and looking so kind. Um, but the words coming out were a bit biting. And so the student that I was working with was really kind of confused about the whole thing and wasn't sure how she felt about the adult because I think it wasn't matching for her, right? And that's just confusing. Um, so just trying to be genuine. You don't always have to be sugar sweet. Try Just try to make those two things match. You're allowed to have upset days, right? You're allowed to get angry at times, but trying to match what you're saying to how you look is important for kids. Okay. Couple of other things that matter. Um, contempt and hostility. Okay, so these are two actually fairly destructive um, emotions in relationship. Contempt is the eye rolling relationship or is the eye rolling emotion. Sorry. So uh, anybody with teenagers understands contempt well, you have seen it again and again and again. It's like, oh, come on, you're kidding me. All right. That sort of uh, and, and, and doing it once or twice and, and it, it happens, everybody does it, but consistent contempt becomes a problem. Same with hostility and hostility is you will do, you know, raised voice, pointing finger. Um, it, it's sort of a power play and it happens on both sides. Uh, hostility happens from, from parent to child and from child to parent. These things cause problems, they cause real problems. So if they're happening, then uh, we need to change um, patterns, we need to we need to shift some of those emotions out, because um, we don't want to have problems in the relationship as a result. One of the other main things that causes problems in relationships is inflexibility. So the inability to sort of move and shift and change and adapt with whatever's going on. And um, again, I think Ange has a has an example for us here. Yeah, I, um, I really, my example is around uh, homework, which I'm sure I'm probably not the only one that has that struggle in their home. But um, one of the things that we have had to uh, let go of a little bit is around kind of the restrictions and the expectations around homework. So we were finding the more we were pushing on uh, do the homework at this such a particular time or in a particular way, or even with us um, wanting to come alongside and help her, that was even sometimes causing some challenges. And so what we found was 
the more flexibility we gave um, for her to get her homework done in at her own pace on her own kind of schedule um, and in her own way and just be available to support her if we if she needed us um, ended up having more success than if we pushed the issue and and tried to um, insist that homework be done in a particular way. All right, and again, that adaptability makes all the difference. It helps save the relationship. It helps keep it on positive footing, all right? Quick way to remember a bunch of the important concepts in attachment theory. Recognize, respond, repair. Recognize is about attunement. Notice what's going on. Understand your child's needs. Response is about taking action. Okay, so it's great to recognize. Now I need to do something. My child wants to talk to me. Away goes the phone. We go play. I talk to her about whatever's upsetting her. You know, we go and explore the world. Okay. Respond, take action, and then repair. Inevitably, we miss things. Inevitably. Um, there is not a parent on the face of the earth that has ever gotten all of this right, ever. So when we make a mistake, when we miss a need, we repair it. We say, Oops, sorry, missed that one. Um, but I'm back with you now. So let's go. What is it that we need to do? Okay, recognize, respond, repair. Um, um, yeah. So if we think about attachment theory, um, let's do a quick summary. The things that matter, comfort and soothe, ex encourage exploration, know what you're more comfortable with. Pay attention to your child's thoughts, feelings and behaviors. Okay, this is the attunement part. We need more positive interactions than negative interactions and especially be aware of contempt and hostility. We need to be flexible and genuine. There are, there are lots of ways to get to where you wanna be. If this, if this way is not working, well, then try this way. Okay? And then as a, as a way to, to keep it in your head, recognize, respond, repair. Now I've been doing a lot of talking. We've all been doing a lot of talking. I don't know if we've seen any questions come through, um, but um, please put your questions in as they occur to you. Um, this is sort of the end of the first section. So it's a great place to ask questions. Um, and we can always, if you think of a question you had from before, we can always go back and revisit. But uh, for now, we'll keep on moving on. All right, so back to the triangle again. It shows up three times in this, and that's because, well, because there are three components to it, and it's because we want you to remember it. All right, so next area that we're going to talk about is competence. And competence is a massive topic. There is way too much to talk about here. We can't possibly cover it all. So we are going to, there, there are just so many things to become good at. Um, you think about your child as an infant and all the things that they have to learn. It's huge, it's enormous. Um, so we're, gonna, we're just gonna talk a little bit about a couple of things that matter and mostly about the process of learning and sometimes where people get stuck. Okay. So all skill comes as a progression. And the progression is from external to internal. Initially, we can't do anything on our own. Over time, we learn to do things on our own. The way we develop that skill is through practice. We try something, we frequently fail, and anybody who's watched a child um, learn to walk has seen this. How many times did your child plop on the floor, you know, trying to take a step before they actually got that first step in? We try, we fail, and we repeat. We keep going and going and going. And this idea of failure is actually really important. Your, and your kids are familiar with this from school. All of your kids have heard about something that's called the growth mindset. And so um, when they make mistakes, it's really important to say to them, look, that's, that's what we expect. And in fact, the place where you learn things is right at the boundary between what you know and what you don't know. And if you're working at that boundary, you will make mistakes. There's no way around it, okay? So, so this is kind of nice, actually. All skills can be learned through practice. And we try, we fail, we repeat. That's the way it goes. There are a few main ways that we learn things, okay? And, um, oh, yeah, sorry. There are a few main ways that we learn things. And those are um, modeling, instruction, and experience, okay? 
So let's talk about modeling for just a second. Modeling is I see it, then I do it. And Tiffany's got an example for us to uh, illustrate. So my son is a, a bit strong minded. That's my nice word for it. And so instruction we haven't talked about yet, but he wasn't exactly interested in us telling him how to do things or encouraging. What was amazing was watching how he changed once he started junior kindergarten. So he's a December baby and he was so three, right, starting school. What he learned in that first year watching those SK kids that he wanted to be like taught him more than what we could get him to do on our own. Um, not all of it was good, <laughs> but his independence grew incredibly by watching those older kids and wanting to be like them. All right, and that's it exactly. I watch, I do, okay? Um, another way we learn is through instruction. And this is the way we usually think about learning. Instruction is sort of school learning. There's a verbal instruction on how you do it. Sometimes there's some feedback. And then by, through that, I learn you know, all kinds of different stuff. I learn my math concepts. I learn how to read. I learn all kinds of stuff, okay? Another way that we learn is through experience. And experience is a good teacher and it can also be a harsh teacher. And um, experience is something that we often don't think about when we think about learning. But um, when we do something and there's an outcome, we learn from that. And lots of, lots of people will say, well, is this child able to learn this? And to me, the answer is frequently yes. Yes, they can learn it. They can learn it through experience. And um, Laura's going to give us a, a, an amusing example about um, how that can happen with, with, uh, with animals, in fact, that aren't nearly as smart as human beings. So, um, so this example involves uh, Stinky the rat. Um, so of my, of my eight, nine years of university, however long I was in university, seemed like an eternity. Um, one of my most profound and meaningful experiences involved a rat. Um, so it was a course, it was a course in, um, in uh, behavioral modification. And basically the, the, what that means is how experience teaches things essentially. Um, and so my group was tasked with training Stinky the rat to learn to press a lever for a food pellet. And Stinky by all accounts was not even bright by rat standards. So most rats can run a straight maze, meaning that they have one pathway to go to get a pellet of food. Stinky had a hard time with that. So he was not the brightest of rats. Um, so to train Stinky to press a lever to push a rat seemed a little bit insurmountable um, because in case you don't know, rats are not naturally born pressing levers for food. So it's a very unrat behavior. Um, so how I think about teaching Stinky that, uh, it's a process called shaping. Um, and basically you put him in, it's called a Skinner box and it's just a box. And um, over on one side, there's a lever that if they push it, they get a food pellet. So in order to train them to do that, they're wandering around in the box and let's say they happen to turn in the direction of the box. You would administer a food pellet. They go over, they get the food pellet and they really don't know what happened there, but they know they got a food pellet. So then the next time that they happen to turn in that direction, lo and behold, they get another food pellet. And by then they're starting to make the connection that if I turn in this direction, I get a food pellet. And then we up the ante and we say, okay, Stinky, you got that. But now we're gonna make you turn your whole body towards the leaper. So you have to just sit there and wait until he happens to turn his whole body, pellet comes out, process repeats. Until eventually he makes his way over to the lever and by some fluke at some point, he happens to press the lever, food pellet comes out. That happens a couple of times. All of a sudden Stinky knows how to press a lever to get a food pellet. Um, so we give this example, um, not only because it's amusing and fun, but also because we do get the question very frequently about kids with special needs, um, kids with ASD, for example, kids with intellectual disabilities. Um, and we have the question often, well, can, can this child learn? And the answer is, is yes. They may not be able to learn the same things, some of them at the same rate as some of their peers, um, but they certainly, every, every person has the capacity to learn um, to the best of their ability. Um, and we can often use experience and, and that kind of, we're going to talk more about this later idea of reinforcement and that kind of thing to help teach and shape behavior. So that's my stinky example. You know what, Laura, I've heard that example a whole pile of times. How long did it take? That's a good question, Dave. I think it took shockingly less time than what we thought it would. Like, okay. I, I can't remember because we would only have that lab like once a week. 
So that would be a long time between repetitions for stinks. Um, so I think um, it was almost like each week that we went in, we would increase the criterion, meaning that we would increase what he would have to do. Um, so, but I don't think it actually, it, it did not take as long as you might think to train a very smart rat to press a lever. So, so that just gives you an example of how incredibly powerful experience is, incredibly powerful, okay? And uh, um, like Laura said, we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. All right, so these are the different ways we learn. Okay, now, what do we learn? And this is, this is what we can't talk about. <laughs> There's just so much um, that, that you, we can't possibly talk about all of it. But we took three of our favorites and uh, we're gonna just very briefly talk about this. Um, and, and try to connect it to some of the uh, um, some of the things that you're probably experiencing as parents. Okay, so some of the most important things that we learn are super basic, um, and the ones we have listed are stop, go, and wait. And what on earth does that mean? Okay, so think about it for just a second. Um, I'm hoping that most of you have eaten supper at this point. Um, I don't know if any of you. We'll go back to the cookies because uh, cookies are good. Um, so I don't know if you had any cookies for dessert, but sometimes you might have one cookie and you think, ooh, another one would be really good, but I probably shouldn't, but you do it anyways, okay? That's a stop problem, okay? And we see stop problems all, <laughs> Tiffany doesn't agree. Um, we see stop problems all over the place with, uh, um, with kids, okay? So um, you think about physical aggression. Physical aggression is often a stop problem. I wanted to hit you. I didn't stop myself before it happened. That's a stop problem. And um, think about uh, getting off technology to come and eat supper. Um, that's a stop problem. So stop is, is in some ways the most foundational thing that we need to learn. Um, the ability to inhibit ourselves, the ability to stop ourselves from doing something is, is the foundation of a whole bunch of self-control. Flip side of that is go. Um, so getting out of bed in the morning is a go problem. All right. Uh, I don't know if any of you share that with me, but uh, sometimes bed is warm and comfortable and it's very difficult to get out. And I have to say go a whole bunch of times before I actually go. Doing your homework, doing your online learning, um, you know, cleaning your room. These are go problems. All right. Aside from that, uh, one of the other main things that we uh, um, like to focus on is weight. And um, probably one of the, you know, you know this from experience, you, um, as soon as you get involved in something that requires all of your attention, that's probably when your child's going to show up and start talking to you. So, you know, you're talking on the phone with a friend or, uh, you know, you're doing something really important for work and they just come and it's like, they insert themselves in and it's, you need to wait. And we, again, we see this in school all the time. Kids blurting things out, kids interrupting. Um, waiting is hard. Waiting is really, really hard. Waiting your turn in a game. Um, so there are all kinds of places where these show up and they're, they're really basic, um, but that doesn't mean they're easy. Um, so uh, I think uh, Tiffany's got an example for us. Um, no, I was just gonna do a clarifying because I think that I just wanna connect that to the attunement discussion we had earlier about mm -hmm. the idea of dropping everything and being attuned to your child. Um, this would be a good example of the way you ask them to wait can be attuned to their emotional needs, right? I just need these few minutes and then we're going to have that time together. So letting them know that you're going to get to them, following through on that, but you don't have to stop your life all the time, every time in that moment to be attuned. So I just want to make that comparison there. Absolutely. Thanks, Tiffany. Okay. All right. So now, uh, do you guys have any questions? No? No, all right. We are looking for questions if you got them. It, it's, always, it's always nice if uh, there's a bit of interaction back and forth between uh, us and you and anything that we can answer, we will. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, patterns that happen in learning. And these patterns can be good and they can be bad. And there's, there's sort of a there's sort of a mirror image um, that, that we're gonna talk a little bit about. So we're gonna start with the good side because you will see this in your, in your children. And um, we're gonna talk about a virtuous cycle. So virtuous cycle is where um, 
child has some skill, they have a bunch of positive beliefs, there's a bunch of positive emotion attached to something. And so the last, the last part, approach means that they do it. Okay, so quick example. Somebody's good at hockey, right? So they've got a little bit of skill to start. They think they're pretty good at hockey. And when they do it, they have fun. So what happens? They play mini sticks, they play road hockey outside, you know, they play on their team and they just keep playing hockey. And then what happens? Skill gets better. And then they believe even more that they're pretty good at this and it becomes even more fun. And so these things build on each other. They, it gets better and better and better and better, okay? This kind of a cycle is also facilitated by um, adults believing that a child is capable, okay? So if, uh, you know, a parent of this child says, wow, you know, we're really good at hockey um, and tells other people and, you know, they come to believe that, yeah, this is, this is, a, this is something that they're really good at. That's how virtuous cycles are formed. Okay, and here uh, Tiffany's got an example for us. Well, I think that was a great example with hockey. It was, for me, what I found fun to watch because we often see the alternate, which I won't tip that yet. Um, but when my daughter started playing piano, uh, I watched this cycle work in the most beautiful way. And it was the approach that caught me off guard. She's musical just by tendency. Like she just is a musical person. Um, she had played around with music. So she felt like she had some skill. She really liked it. It made her happy. But what surprised me is that I didn't have to ask her to practice ever. She would just walk by the keyboard. She'd stop and she'd play something. So I didn't have to have an incentive program or anything. And so it was um, fun to see the other side which we'll now talk about. But when it goes well, it's really fun to watch. If we're talking about the other side in piano, that would be my daughter's. So, uh, <laughs> okay, the flip side, the mirror image of the virtuous cycle is the vicious cycle, okay? And you will recognize this too. And what's interesting about this is a child can be engaged in both in different areas of their life, okay? So the vicious Oh, hold on, I haven't changed it. There we go. The vicious cycle contains exactly the same components in the opposite direction, okay? So there's a, a, a lack of skill and or there's a belief that there's a lack of skill, okay? And there are negative beliefs. I'm no good at this. I don't wanna do this. This doesn't matter anyways. Some sort of negative belief. There's negative emotion attached to this. This is boring. I don't like this. I hate this. You know, there, there's some kind of negative emotion attached to it. Um, frustration will often be one. And then there is frequently avoidance. And when you avoid, your skill doesn't improve and it reinforces the negative belief and the fact that you hate it. And it just keeps going and going and going. And we see kids get stuck in these and where they weren't that far behind their peers on something a little while ago, all of a sudden they're miles behind because they haven't been practicing and their peers have been practicing. So they fall further and further and further behind. Um, it's really, really difficult. Again, adult belief is often like, Ooh, I don't think you can do this. Um, so there's, uh, you know, there's kind of th that element to it too. That's one of the ways that uh, adults feed into it. And just got, and just got a, an example for us about a vicious cycle. Yeah, so uh, I do. My, um, I'll share for a second about my daughter in reading. So my daughter um, was behind in reading at one point. Um, it's, it was in the elementary years. So it was when reading programs and home reading was a big thing. And uh, at one point, um, she, didn't, she didn't necessarily want to engage with it. And at one point, she was about three or four grades behind in reading. Um, and we really needed to, we really felt we needed to do something about it. But um, she was feeling very much like she didn't have the skills to be able to read. Um, she really didn't even want to try at that point. Uh, she, I remember her saying at one point that she thought she'll never be a good reader. Um, and, uh, and when we were doing the home reading programs and even some of the, um, the early reading intervention programs that the school was offering, she would refuse to participate. And so it got to the point where as parents, we were feeling really discouraged about her reading because we couldn't even get to her to engage at home in books that we thought she would probably like. It really became a, a barrier for us. I'll pause there, Dave, and you can. Uh... Yeah, yeah. So, so you see in Angie's example, right? 
There's an initial lack of skill. It may not be that big a deal, but she feels like she's a little bit behind. There's a negative belief, there's negative emotion, and there's avoidance, all of those components, okay? So what do we do about, uh, okay, what do we do about slides that won't change? There we go, um, there we go. What do we do about vicious cycles? Okay, well, the good thing about any, any cycle, a vicious or a virtuous cycle, is that we can change or amplify it. And we can do that at any point in the cycle. So we can work with skill, we can work with belief, we can work with emotion, or we can get them to approach, to practice, instead of avoiding something. We can do any of those things, and we can do more than one at the same time, and we can break a vicious cycle and turn it into a virtuous cycle. Also very important to check our belief, okay? I think you heard Ange say, we weren't quite sure is she gonna be able to do it, okay? And so um, changing our own belief is, is often a, a chunk of this. And so, um, you know, we're halfway through Ange's story, so I wanna let her finish it. Sure, thanks, Dave. Um, yeah, so really as parents, um, we started to recognize that we needed some kind of an intervention to, to be able to address kind of the, the lack of reading or the lack of skill around reading. And so um, we were finding that there was enough tension around reading that we need as parents needed to back off. So we actually um, looked into a, a reading app um, that she was, she had quite taken to. And so we used that app to um, try to build her reading skills. So what happened was it wasn't necessarily intentional at all, because I, I have to admit, I didn't know about skill, belief, emotion and approach, but we, we definitely recognized that she needed to practice um, in order to feel good about it. And so the more that she read and, and started reading with this app, the more she started to believe that she was actually a reader. Um, and, the, and the more that she started to believe that she was read, like a good reader, the more she engaged with it. And she really started to build the skill and started to feel good about reading. Um, um, and it, it, it definitely took her a little bit longer, but we, we certainly got there. And in the most recent, which I, as a parent, and I, I hate to say that I, you know, had maybe, um, I don't want to say, I guess, negative beliefs kind of around, around her skill, but just really was, you know, wondering if we were ever going to get there and what kind of a reader she'd be. She's actually writing stories at this point, and those are being um, made available on the app that she started reading on a number of years ago. And so she's really come a long way. And I know that's maybe not everybody's story, but I, I highlight it because it's so significant, the interplay between the skill, belief, emotion and approach that makes such a difference um, and made such a difference in her and her reading that, um, you know, she's, she's actually at the point, so she's in grade nine now, and she's actually at the point of taking, um, you know, the English literature content at an academic level, which we never thought would be possible. So. Well, that, that's, that's really impressive. And this, Oh, sorry, go ahead, Tiffany. Well, I was just gonna say, and I know that in conversations other times, she also has an artistic side. And so we've taken out some of the content around building other strengths. And I think that was really special for her, right? To be good at something and spend time doing something that felt good at the same time or parallel to working away at the reading. And, and in some ways she was good at artistic stuff and so that would be the virtuous cycle. So sometimes moving back and forth between the cycles makes sense, right? When you get tired of working in the area where it's like, I can't do this, then switch over to something that feels good. It's like, okay, I can do this. It helps you recognize these different elements, the skill, the belief, the emotion, and that I'm doing it, okay? And again, not everybody gets results like Ange does. That's actually quite incredible. It doesn't happen all that often but improvement happens for sure. And so parental belief doesn't need to be, I believe that you can do this every bit as well as everybody else. If your child has a really significant learning disability, then their chances of reading as well as everybody else, that's extremely low. But I do believe that you can learn. I do believe that you can, you can be better than you are right now. I have no doubt about that, right? And so that in some ways needs to be a core parental belief. I believe that if you do these things, you will see improvement. Um, okay, so uh, so just to, 
it, this isn't, uh, you know, I believe you can be an astronaut and so you will be. That's, that's not what we're talking about. Um, we're talking about, you know, belief in the process that you can improve for sure. Okay. Anything else to add, anyone? Uh, there were a couple of questions in the chat, but I think Great. they may be addressed as we go through the next section. So I'm just going to say at some point when one of us is talking, Dave, if you want to read those chat questions, just so they're in your mind as well. Okay. Yep. Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. So takeaways in terms of competence, think about your child or your children. In what areas do they lack skill? In what areas do they need to make improvements? What's the practice that's gonna help them develop that competence? What do they actually need to do? And again, um, interesting in Ange's, in Ange's uh, example, the place that they intervened was in approach, actually doing it, right? We changed it so it was fun so that you actually do it. How can you help them practice? What are they good at? Where are the virtuous cycles? And there's, can their skill in that area be used to impact um, you know, skill in the other area, just like we highlighted with uh, Angie's daughter, the, the art impacting the reading. Where's the vicious cycle? What are the skill deficits? What are the beliefs? What are the feelings? What does the avoidance look like? Okay. Don't think about avoidance as something that, okay, if I push you hard enough and I force like crazy, I'll get you to approach. That's not the way it works. Okay. Um, Again, think about Ange's way to encourage approach, which was by making it appealing. Um, and that's hard, that's really hard, but sometimes you can find something that makes a difference there. Can you address one or more of the elements in that cycle? Okay, so I would really encourage you to actually sit down with a piece of paper and list out, okay? Skill deficits, beliefs, emotions, what does the avoidance look like? What would approach look like in that situation? How are we gonna encourage that approach? So, Can I just chime in for a sec, Dave? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, go. Um, I was just going to add that it, oftentimes there's not just one vicious cycle that's happening in one area. Um, with a lot of kids, especially kids that have, you know, higher needs, you can have many vicious cycles going on at the same time. Um, and it can be really, really hard to break, break those, right? Because you've been doing the same dance over and over again. Um, and, you know, when you try to break that pattern, the kid still thinks you're doing that dance, right? So it, it sometimes takes a while to break these cycles, especially when they become very entrenched and very kind of broad and taking over many aspects of your relationship. So it's by no means um, an easy thing to do to just break those cycles. Um, and it can take a lot of a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of sort of you know, emotion behind it as well. So just kind of being aware that that this is not easy, and, and there's often a lot of negative emotion built up as well. So, you know, just just keep that in mind that it's going to take time to learn a new dance. Thanks, Laura. Um, and I guess that we should maybe start out with that. Quite frankly, we're going to tell you a whole bunch of things that aren't easy. Um, I, I think that's uh, that's not a bad way to put this because the attachment stuff, the attunement, and all the rest of that, it's work. It's uh, it's hard. Um, breaking these kinds of cycles is hard. Developing skill is hard. Um, so, so just because we can sit here and talk about it, don't think for a second that we think, oh yeah, man, yeah, you can do this in five minutes. It's, it's not really a big deal. That's not the way it is. Okay. So um, on that note, let's move to something else that's difficult. Um, triangle again. And we are talking about the third component of the triangle. We are talking about discipline. And discipline is the most contentious of all of these. Probably so far, most people would think, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, yeah, that's fine. When we get to discipline, um, that's when people really start to disagree. So what we're going to do is we're going to present um, a whole bunch of stuff um, that we believe in, that we think is helpful, and it, is, um, and it gives you options. And so if there's anything that we present in here that you think, oh, I'm not doing that, that's fine. Um, you've got a bunch of other options, okay? Um, so let's see. We are typically, when we discipline kids, we are very focused on enlisting them as allies. From a young age, we tell them what's going on. We tell them exactly what's going to happen and we tell them exactly what we want. 
and we tell them what's going to what's going to happen as a result of that. Okay. So, with that said, what do we discipline? Um, and I, I think that's simple. We know that moving into adulthood, that love and competence are two central pillars of well-being. These things matter. So what do we discipline? We discipline anything that's going to get in the way of those two things. So if there's something that's going to prevent your child from developing connections, that's going to be discipline. If there is something that's going to prevent your child from becoming competent, from becoming good at things, from developing skill, we discipline that too. Okay. And so a um, couple of concrete examples. The fastest way to make yourself unlovable is to be physically aggressive, okay? So that would be something that we would tend to discipline um, right off the bat. Um, I don't think I know about a child on the face of the earth that has not been physically aggressive, um, but maybe there are some. Um, I know mine certainly were when they were very young. Same, same for competence. Anything that gets in the way of actually becoming good at stuff um, that we need to say, no, nah, you know what? That's not good enough. We can do better than that. Okay, so that's what we discipline. Why do we discipline? We discipline because the actual consequences. So, so go back to what we were talking about. Go back to Stinky for a second. Okay, um, Stinky got an immediate outcome from what he did. I'm assuming Stinky was male. Is that true? Okay. Um, so there was an immediate outcome. Well, the simple fact is that a lot of what we do does not have the immediate outcome. Okay, so think about this for just a second. Two young kids playing in a sandbox or at a playground. Child one has a truck. Child two wants the truck. Child two hits child one. Child one starts crying and goes and runs to his mom. Child two goes, hey, I got the truck. In his mind, what's the outcome? The outcome is I got the truck. We know as adults that that's not actually not, that's not the outcome. That's not the ultimate outcome. If he keeps doing that, then people aren't going to want to play with him. We know that. He doesn't know that. Okay? So this is why we discipline. The natural consequence is a ways away, and we need to let them know, no, you can't do that. Okay? And so, yeah, go, go Tiffany. I was just going to say, so the two chat things that came up had to do with weight. Okay, and so interrupting and not being able to wait. And the other one had to do with avoiding schoolwork through affection. So coming for hugs when they should be doing online learning. So I just want those two things in your mind as we start going through um, some of the strategies, folks, that see how those could fit in on how you could manage um, those two situations. And I'd be interested to hear what you're thinking as we get through it. Okay, and if I forget about it, you'll remind me, yes? Okay, beautiful, thanks. Okay, so couple of definitions. Um, when we think about behavior, we tend to think about bad behavior. Okay. That's not what we're talking about. When we're, when we're talking about behavior, we're talking about any behavior. So again, in Laura's example, stinky pressing the lever is a behavior. Okay. It's in fact the behavior they want, but it's a behavior. Behavior is any behavior. Okay. To increase behavior, you reinforce. And if behavior increases, then you have been reinforcing what's going on. So let me give you an example. If when your child does something, I don't know, let's say they use a whiny tone of voice. If when they do that, you yell at them. Okay, we'll go extreme. You yell at them. Um, and over time, and every time they do it, you yell at them. And over time, your child whines more and more and more and more. You are actually reinforcing behavior. Okay? We usually think of reinforcements as something nice. That's not true. A reinforcement is anything that increases behavior. So one of the things about all of this discipline stuff is you actually have to pay really close attention to over time, what's the outcome? What's happening as a result of these things that I'm doing? Anything that decreases behavior is a consequence. And again, if 
your child um, holds the door for somebody um, and does this repeatedly. And you've, you say to them, oh, great job of holding the door. And as you do that, more and more and more, they don't hold the door for people. If you are decreasing their behavior, then you're actually providing a consequence. You're decreasing behavior. Not, you're not, even though it's some, you, something you might think is nice, you're decreasing the behavior. Okay, so paying attention to outcome really, really, really matters. All right, so your, your discipline star is reinforcement. Um, go back for just a second to relationship. Um, five to one ratio of positive to negative. This is what we're looking for reinforcements are typically experienced as positive things okay they are things that people like most of the time okay just because you think they'll like it doesn't mean they will like it all right um it's really important that they like it now um laura why don't why don't we go with your example now Okay, so this was when, uh, so I was on the accelerated program with my daughters and they were only 14 months apart. So there's a period of my life that's a little bit hazy. Um, but this would have been when my youngest daughter was somewhere between six and eight months old. Um, and we would sit down for supper at the table and she'd be in her high chair and my other daughter would be in her booster seat, my husband and I. And um, Audrey is my youngest daughter's name. She would repeatedly make this horrible screeching noise is the best way I can describe it. And I couldn't for the life, like, why is she doing this? Why is she making this noise? And then I reached back into the files of my brain that held information other than dealing with the input and output of the human body. And I remembered this idea of reinforcement of positive opposites. And I realized that every single time she made that noise at the table, all of our heads would turn to her, my husband's, my other daughter's, and mine. We would all look right at her. And I realized she's doing that because as soon as she does it, we look at her. So I instructed my husband and my other daughter. I said, as soon as she starts making that noise, we are all going to turn our backs on her. The second that she stops making the noise, we turn and we give her big smiles and cooing and all that stuff. And I think it took maybe two to three repetitions of that at like one meal and that was it, no more screeching behavior. Um, so that's just the power of, you know, making, trying to figure out what, what is it that's um, maintaining this behavior and then you remove that and then you actually look for the opposite of what they've been doing and you reinforce that behavior. Okay, so I, I just, I love that example. It's, uh, it's, it's absolutely beautiful and again, um, Think about your child for a second. So, so the idea of the positive opposite, what's the positive opposite of screeching? It's quiet. So think about your child. What's the behavior they're doing that's a problem? What is the positive opposite? What is it that you actually want to see in place of that? Okay, and again, um, one of the things I really encourage you to do uh, when you leave here is, is put some of these things down on paper, okay? What's the positive opposite? Don't pick too many behaviors, probably pick one or two at most, okay? It's easy to get overwhelmed by 25 positive opposites and then you just don't know which end is up anymore. Okay, Tiffany? Yeah, there's a nice example actually in the chat. Um, okay. Sam is asking about a child who uses affection to take breaks from online schoolwork. So he comes, he comes, he's working upstairs, he's focused, he comes downstairs and he wants hugs, okay? So then we were talking about reinforcing and the question was, how do I not reinforce hugs and affection, right? He's been trying a hug delay or a schedule, but it's difficult. So just thinking about that yeah. example. Um, yeah. So, so that's, that's so difficult. And, um, you know, uh, I'll be interested in, in everybody's opinion on this. One of the things that we, if you break it down for a second, and again, my first question would be, why does he want a hug? Is this comfort? Is this soothing? Is this um, something else? Okay. Um, the thing that I'd be, the first thing that I try, the first thing I'd be inclined to do is actually when they're upstairs doing their work on the computer, that's when I would go and I give them a sideways hug, right? I go sit, be, sit beside him. I put my arm around his shoulder and say, 
while you're working hard, that's fantastic. As soon as you're done this, why don't you come down for a little snuggle, right? So um, giving them a clear, finish this, you have to do this section, but reinforcing what you want to see. So what's the positive opposite of leaving your work and coming for a hug? Well, the positive opposite is continuing your work. So what you have to do is you have to reinforce continuance of work. You can only do that, like in Laura's stinky example, you can only do that when he does what he, need, what he needs to be doing, all right? So that, that is the very first thing I would try. Um, Tiffany and Laura, I'm not sure if you would have uh, other ideas on that, Ange, but uh, that's, that's what I would be doing. That was my exact idea too, Dave, because right now the contingency is that he takes a break from his work, comes downstairs, he gets a hug. So the hug is then reinforcing the break from the work. So you need to make the hug contingent upon him doing his work. So catch him while he's doing his work, give him the hug, connect it verbally. So I'd say, you know, I'm hugging you because you're, you're working so hard right now, um, just to make the contingency really, really clear. Um, so yeah, I would flip it in that same way, Dave. And, and, then, and then beyond that, um, the next progression in some way would be, why don't you come show me when you're done this section you can, uh, you know, whatever it is, sit on my lap or I'll give you a hug and we'll go through what you've done, right? So, so it's first I, first I reinforce while you're doing the work, then I reinforce when you've completed the work, all right? And then, uh, and then we can go from there, okay? All right, um, sorry, I, uh, okay, we're good to go? All right, excellent, thanks for that question. How do we reinforce um, or what do we reinforce with? And people usually think about reinforcement in stinky terms, right? This is like, uh, you know, we, we, we give you a smarty because you peed on the toilet or, you know, we, uh, um, we you know, presuming your child is toilet training age. Um, um, or we, uh, um, you know, we give you stickers or stars or whatever. So those are tangibles. Those are things, anything you can see, you know, we work towards, we're going to buy you this toy if you do this, that, and the next thing. Um, so those are all tangible rewards. Personal favorite is actually social rewards. Um, social rewards are things like interaction, um, a play, touch. So the, the sideways hug as your child's working, that's a social reward. Um, eye contact, smiles. We don't, we don't focus nearly enough on facial expression and even eye contact and attention as a reward. It is, and it's a very, very powerful one. The, uh, um, the reason I like social interactions is if we go back to the triangle, and I'm not going to flip back there because it'll make you seasick, um, but, our, our, and actually I didn't say this, some people think of love and connection as the most fundamental human psychological need, okay? So if that's the case, and, and I believe that to be true, if that's the case, then what's our most powerful reinforcer? Our most powerful reinforcer is love and connection. And so I'm gonna use that. Um, and um, again, you know, doesn't mean love's unconditional. I'm gonna love you no matter what, but I'm gonna give you a hug when you're doing what you're supposed to be doing right? Yeah, I give it to you other times too, when you need the comfort and all the rest of it. But um, I'm going to use it to help shape your behavior and move it in the direction you want to go. It's the food pellet. Okay. All right. So, oh, hold on. Laura, did you have an example here or not? Oh, no, not yet. Next one, I think. Okay. Reinforcement. How do we reinforce? Lots of nonverbals. Okay especially with younger and uh, younger children and low functioning people. And this is, sorry, this is where I'm thinking, Laura, about your example. So this is based on some work that Dave and I did um, a number of years ago. Um, and we were working with kids that were struggling with behavior. Um, and we were specifically working with um, the grownups, basically, and teaching. Hi. Hang on. Hey, on a call. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> emerging. <laughs> I'm not being very attuned right now. Um, um, now I totally lost my train of thought. Oh, good God. Okay. We were, we were, me and you were working, training adults. Thank you. Yes, training adults. 
So one of the things that we were training the adults to do was how to apply this idea of social reinforcement to the kids that they were working with. Um, and it's often challenging because all, a lot of these kids were very challenging kids. And so we noticed that initially when we were teaching them how to kind of give social reinforcement, it was going to be a good job, well done, kind of delivered in that manner. And we realized that they weren't sort of connecting the, the, the non-verbals to the verbals. So we wound up really spending a lot of time teaching people how to match your non-verbals to what you're saying and how to provide that social reinforcement, um, you know, in a, in a more effective way. So, you know, talking about making eye contact, having a big smile, um, having your verbals and your non-verbals match. Um, and it was really interesting to see how, how the reinforcement then actually became more powerful and effective once the adults started behaving in that way. Um, and we, we had this one particular EA that we worked with um, and she was just so emotive and just could just express so many feelings in her face. And man, did the kids ever, ever navigate to her um, and really responded well to her. And we honestly felt like it was because she was really providing that social reinforcement so effectively. Thanks, Laura. Okay, so um, I just becoming aware of the time and we need to keep moving. So we're gonna move on to the negative, the, the consequences side of things. You can call it negative, consequences are important. Um, and this is where things start to become really, uh, um, can become contentious. So we have four sort of different types of consequences and discipline is interesting because you have these five, you have five building blocks, five Lego blocks, basically reinforcement. It's, it's like, it's like the Lego block with eight bumps. It's like, you need a million of those. You, you will use that all the time, all over the place. Okay. And then, and then we have these four consequences that we would use. The first consequence is simple. Um, it's uh, we call it instruction and it is just a simple, don't do that, do this instead. So there's not a lot of emotion attached to it. It's just a simple, straightforward, no, don't do that, do this instead. So stop that, come on, you gotta do this now, right? And, and that's all it is, okay? It's the least intrusive form of consequence, okay? Stepping up just a touch. This in some ways has become my favorite um, type of consequence. And um, technical term is overcorrection. And everybody knows what this is, it's repeated practice. When you were in school, if when you walk down the hall incorrectly to gym, your teacher said, oh, okay, that wasn't very good. Let's go back and do that again. That's overcorrection. And as a rule of thumb, for every time you do it wrong, you do it right twice. Okay, so um, let's, think about, uh, let's think about that for a second. Um, I wonder if you could build in here um, experience or practice of waiting. Because that was one of the other questions in the chat is helping a child learn to wait. Sure, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So um, somebody send the age of the child. I don't have access to the chat. I've totally lost access to the chat. So um, I don't know. Let's take a weight of, uh, give me a, a weight example. That's what I want. So the example that was listed was. Um, trying to be really kind about letting the son know he needs to wait and exactly how long he needs to wait. First, I need to do this and then you can have this. She has a hand signal to go with it, um, okay. but she's okay. hoping it will not be like this forever. We need to okay. give hope. <laughs> <laughs> it's not gonna be like this forever. Okay, so um, let's say uh, we'll use the example of supper. Okay, I'm hungry, I don't wanna wait for supper. Okay, but it could be anything. Doesn't matter what the end thing is. Okay, so. Um, what would happen in that moment is, you know what, it's not done, it's not ready to go, you have to wait, okay? And so, because you're struggling with it right now, now's the time when you're actually going to have to practice waiting, okay? So, supper was going to be ready in two minutes, so what I need you to do is I need you to wait for two minutes, okay? So, you're going to go over there and you're going to sit quietly, and then in two minutes, and you, you know, you can send them with a timer and all the rest of it, you can, you know, you can play a game, you can do whatever. It's not like a timeout or something like that. It's like, you're just waiting. Okay. If they need some suggestions on how to wait, you can give them to them. You know what? Read a book, 
um, you know, uh, take a look at this, play with your Lego, do this, do that, you know, um, doesn't matter what it is, you can give them suggestions, some suggestions on how to wait. So because you're struggling to wait, what you need to do right now is you need to go over there and wait, you need to wait for two minutes. Supper, by the way, is ready now. Okay, but you're still going to have to wait for two minutes. And then it's like, okay, yeah, that wasn't bad. And uh, guess what, you're, we're going to because you're struggling with it, we're going to do it again. Okay, and this is just to remind you, you need to be able to wait. So, you know, again, supper has been ready for three minutes now. And uh, it's like, okay, but we're still going to practice waiting. Okay, so that's, that's the kind of thing that you do. That's the way you use overcorrection. Okay, every time you do it wrong, you do it right twice. Now, now, um, Can I add to that, Dave? Yeah, yeah, go. This is where we can kind of combine some of these techniques that we've been talking about, where you do the overcorrection, the practice of weight, you're going to add in the reinforcement, right? So at the end of that two minutes, wow, I know that was really hard for you, but you did awesome. You did it. You made it through. Great job, right? So you want to kind of build in now that reinforcement as well. So we're going to actually start layering these techniques. Um, and remember that there's this triangle here, right? So we're building competence while using discipline, and we're also using connection and love. So it's all kind of layered in together. Yep, beautiful. Thanks, Laura. Okay. Um, overcorrection has a close cousin called rehearsal. Um, if waiting for supper continues to be a problem, then you can say, you know what, we're having a lot of trouble with this. And supper's coming up in a little while and you struggle to wait for supper and we get to that two minute mark before and you're really struggling with it. So let's practice what it is that you need to do. We're gonna practice waiting for two minutes. So what's the activity? What's the task? Okay, go, here's the timer or I'll operate the timer if you want. Okay, that was two minutes. That's how long you have to wait, okay? So, so you can do it immediately in the moment and then it's over correction or you can do it as it's before it's about to happen. And that's rehearsal. Okay. So, uh, so again, I, I love this because you're developing competence and you're also teaching them, you know what, you can't do that. You need to do this instead. All right. Okay. Time out. Okay. So here we go. This one is contentious at times and um, I get that. Um, and also I don't get that. Time out is something that is really effective, frequently poorly done, and it is um, it it really makes a difference. Time out was one of the main things I used with my own kids, to be perfectly honest, and uh, and it worked beautifully, and it really shaped their behavior and changed their behavior. Now I know it doesn't work for everybody, and I also know it's not necessary. I have a colleague, um, a psychologist, who I have a lot of respect for. And her kids are late teens, maybe getting into early 20s. And she said she did not give them a single time out through their entire childhood. And so what that tells us is that there are multiple paths to get to where you want to be. I liked it. It was simple. It was straightforward. Um, she didn't like it. She didn't use it. She used other ones. Okay. So that's what you need to know about this. Um, you can leave some of the Lego blocks out if you want. Time out is literally time out from reinforcement. So you remove them from the environment in which they're being reinforced. And because of that, it's short, it's boring, and there is no reinforcement at all. And especially social reinforcement. So you don't sit and talk to them while they're on time out. You don't sit and look at them while they're on time out. They don't play a game while they're on time out. Um, time out in my house was on the stairs, looking at the closet. It was boring, um, but it was also very short. There's no point in giving a child a 10 minute timeout. Um, frequently in schools, we're, we're um, doing like, for little kids, we're doing 30 seconds a minute. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes it's as little as 10, 10 seconds, quite frankly, not 10 minutes. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's short, it's boring. It's like, you can't do that. And then we often incorporate overcorrection. Okay, you did this, it was a problem. Now let's go back and let's do it right. And again, this is the layering that Laura was talking about. We use this discipline technique, then we add this one, all right? And then when they do it right, it's like, then now comes the reinforcement, and then we layer on another discipline technique, okay? So um, 
Um, that's that's a quick version of timeout. I don't know if you guys have anything to add. I want to keep moving because of um, we're almost timeout. Um, all right. Last form of discipline, last Lego block is response cost, fancy word. Everybody knows what this is. This is grounding. This is removal of privileges. So um, this is often used with kids that are older. So, so timeouts, um, you know, I don't think there's a magic age necessarily, but I don't think I would use a timeout much past seven or eight um, for the most part. Um, but one of the things I didn't say about timeout, I think I should say this. Most people think about timeout as a time to calm down. That is not what it is. Timeout is literally timeout from reinforcement. They can do their timeout and if they need to, to calm down, then you, you go and have time to yourself and do something that's soothing and comforting and all the rest of them, okay? But a timeout is not necessarily there to calm you down, okay? So um, response cost, removal of privileges, and this we often use for older kids. Okay, and especially going up to teenagers. Anybody ever uh, was told that, you know, you're grounded for a week or you can't have the car for a week or anything like that, that's, a, that's an example of a response cost, okay? So I'm taking a, a privilege away. Our tendency is to take these privileges away for far too long. Um, you know, uh, I've heard about things being removed for months at times. And, um, and at a certain point, it does not have an impact anymore, okay? So, and, and sometimes we punish ourselves. So if you say no electronics, but they really have to watch a little bit of TV while you get supper ready, um, you kinda, you, you, you made it difficult for yourself, all right? So you have to be careful with these things, okay? And um, I encourage people to not do, not say what the discipline is necessarily in that moment, especially if you're so angry that you're not thinking clearly. Take a little bit of time to think about it, all right? Um, talk to somebody, what makes sense in this situation, right? You can say, you know what, there's gonna be something, I don't know what it is yet, I need to figure it out, okay? All right, so those five pieces, um, they, they go together. You can combine them in any number of ways. And so, um, let's see, mixing the discipline is usually a good idea. Do not end a discipline typically with a sermon. We are learning through experience here, not through instruction, okay? So this is stinky pressing a lever, okay? This is um, you getting to, uh, this is your child getting to understand, I can't do that, that doesn't work. I can't hit somebody else because then this is gonna happen and I don't like that. So discipline is learning through experience. Okay, sorry, did I miss something? I think we're going to skip this. You guys good with that? Okay. Um, you know what, Angie, I really want to do that example. Can we do that now? Yep, absolutely. So I'm going to share um, a scenario that happened in my house last week. So um, my daughter's in grade nine, and it was recommended to her that she probably consider applied math. And um, she really, really, really wanted to try academics. So we gave it a shot and we got to, I don't know, two days before the last day of school and her teacher weighs in to let her know that she, it, should, it, should, it was probably a few more days than two days, but um, let her know that she was not going to get her academic credit, um, but that she could do some papers um, some worksheets to demonstrate that she could get the applied credit, the applied math credit. Um, so there was a combination of things that were happening here and I'll share kind of how we handled it and happily I would take any crit critique and some advice. Um, so we ended up, um, what happened was that was fairly uh, stressful for her. Her anxiety went up, obviously most, most teenagers, they would not want to fail a class after, especially after they've put in all the effort to, uh, to go through the course. Um, so she was emotionally quite upset. And so we ended up, um, we ended up having to provide more emotional support off the start than even focusing on getting the papers done. Um, really more than anything, my husband and I were like, we need to get these papers done because otherwise we're redoing math all over again. And none of us wanted to do that. So um, we uh, had to kind of let it go. We started off by kind of pushing the, getting these papers done. When are you gonna do them? 
uh, you know, kind of a little bit of bugging going on, keeping on top of her, that kind of thing. And we were starting to find she, she was kind of shutting down, to be honest, like she was, she wouldn't, she didn't want to engage, didn't want to talk about it, would get angry if we, if we mentioned it. Yeah, I'm going to get to it kinds of responses. And, um, and we were down to, well, the last day, to be honest, for when they were due. Um, And uh, she had spent a, a tiny bit of time working on them. But one of the things that we tried to do was recognize and and caught ourselves in that week when they were when she was supposed to be working on these math sheets caught ourselves partway through the week realizing this is not getting us anywhere we're not we're not having success with getting these sheets done so we uh we really tried to take a like the approach where we would um support her the emotional side of it because if we didn't focus on the emotional side of it she wasn't going to be able to pull her butt out of bed to actually get to doing the sheets anyway. Um, and she has some, you know, mental health and anxiety. So that plays a bit of a role there as well. But um, yeah, we just, we ended up focusing on, um, it reminds me a little bit, Dave, of kind of when we talked about kind of the beliefs, like you, you can do this and um, kind of motivating her. Our approach was trying to get her to engage. At least let's start looking at the sheets or let's, let's work on one sheet today or, you know, a few questions or whatever. So, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's what we tried to do. We, we did uh, happen to get them done by the last day and we happened to get the credit which is like, yay for us. We're so excited about that because um, we definitely didn't want to go through grade nine math again. Um, but those were some of the things that we we considered and thought of and tried to apply to our scenario to try and make it successful and really had to try and make it successful on a short period of time. We were looking at about a week's worth of time to try and get these sheets done, knowing that she had to go through the emotional um roller coaster ride of of not passing this course and having to re-engage in back into math and on a deadline so i'm i'm happy to hear what suggestions you guys might have <laughs> in, and in some ways um you know i, I guess what the way i'm thinking about this is that we're going to talk about about the model about the love yep. discipline and competence elements and so so uh, you know what i love about it and is the attunement, right? So you are attuned to her emotion, and and this is and this to me is is central. It sucks failing, of course. Like like there's you know there's no way around that. It's terrible. So and and you uh, um, you would clearly acknowledge that. And for some people, you have to spend a lot of time on the emotion before you can get to uh, to some of the behavior, right? So again, if we think about that uh, virtuous and uh, vicious cycle, the elements of that the emotion is like this big and everything else is like this big in her mind, right? And the, the difficult part of that, and, and what, what you recognize here, which is great, is that the behavior for you is this big, right? And everything else is this big, right? Because you know um, what the potential outcomes are gonna be from this. So, so from, a, from a love, from a connection standpoint, you know, I love it. Like, I, I think you, you know, you're attuned and that's great. If you move to a competence standpoint, um, again, you know, I'm thinking vicious cycle right off the bat and I'm thinking about those elements. And so again, you know, you see how these things overlap. We're, we're gonna focus on emotion. We're gonna focus on comforting emotion so that we can get to these other things. And meanwhile, you're sliding in little bits here and there, right? We believe you can do it you know, in some, in some ways kind of, do you believe you can do it, right? Um, and encouraging approach without forcing approach. Um, and, and, you know, those, those kind of, I, again, I like those things. I think that's, that's really important. Um, and if you move to a discipline uh, standpoint in a way of thinking about it, this one's tough. This one's really tough because there's an ele element of me that would want to say to her, you know what, really, really sucks not passing the course. You know what would suck even more? You had to do it again. Um, and so uh, um, the discipline is actually right there. And, and she would learn through experience. If I didn't do this, then... I have to take an entire course again. It's a harsh punishment, 
right? It's really, really harsh. But, um, and I can see why you would want her to avoid it. But from, from you know, a parental discipline standpoint, I'm not sure that I would necessarily apply any of those things. I'd be looking mostly at reinforcing anything that looks like approach behavior to actually doing work, all right? That's what I'm thinking. I, I'd be interested in Tiffany and Laura. I don't know what you would add, what you would subtract, how you would see it. Yeah, I was thinking about the competence piece, right? About what skills does she need to be able to tackle that? What can she use moving forward and just building in some of those structures and things to uh, help her initiate um, and get to it and then just celebrate the heck out of it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. Does the, um, does the experience of almost failing it and the emotional roller coaster of that end up becoming like that's an outcome of what happened. Does that become, I guess the word is a reinforcer to her completing her work the next semester? <laughs> like, does that, I mean, that's a lesson that's learned, right? That I, I hated going through this experience of almost failing. So I happened to get the credit and I, and I, and so I'm, I'm, you know, I was, it was so close. Does that, does that mean that maybe we'll do better next semester? <laughs> Angela, I would say that that's less so about going to reinforce her doing her work and more so a consequence. She's going to learn that that's a consequence of not doing her work. And then we're going to reinforce the positive opposite of not oh. doing her work, which is doing her work. So awesome. About, you know, making, you're going to make this consequence explicit. So look, you didn't do your work. It almost failed, didn't go so great, didn't feel very good, huge emotional roller coaster. We probably don't want to do that again. What's the way to avoid that? You can do your work. You're going to get your work done and you're not going to have that terrible emotional roller coaster. And, you know, when that happens next year and she, you see her doing her work, oh, see there, you're doing your work. Look, that feels good, doesn't it? Right. So that's kind of how I would frame that. That's, that's, and you know what, it's probably accurate to our experience. So we've done three days of, of online learning and she's been on every web, like every uh, Google meet and she has got all her homework done this week so far. So, so you're probably right, Laura, thank you. So, so the thing that I would expect though, is that over time you asked, is it a lesson learned? It's a lesson learned for now. Um, and will she remember it throughout the entire term? Maybe. Um, maybe, but, uh, but maybe not, right? And she may need to be reminded of it, yeah. Okay, I'm just becoming aware of the time. I think we, I, I do wanna very quickly go through the last two slides, I think, okay? So um, sorry for going over time, you guys, and thanks for your patience with it. What we've given you tonight is a whole bunch of, in, of information, okay? And information is great. And we also know that information doesn't necessarily translate into behavior, into action, okay? So one of the things that I really want to encourage you to do is try to take this and put it in action. And there are a couple of ways to do that. The first way is to set an intention. At the beginning of each day, ask yourself the question, how will I love my child today? How am I going to build skill? How am I gonna discipline my child today? Start with that in the forefront of your mind. At the end of each day, review, how did I do? Okay, be kind to yourself. Everybody makes mistakes and you will without any doubt. Okay, so when you do be kind, all right? Think about yourself. Do you usually focus more on the connection, on love, on competence or on discipline? Again, just like in attachment theory, people are more comfortable with one thing than with another thing. Think about what you're comfortable with. Is it always the best thing to use? Okay. Try to develop comfort in the other areas. So if you're, if you're very focused on connection, great. If that sometimes means you don't do discipline, well, then discipline is something that you need to focus on a little bit more. Okay. Being able to recognize when you're stuck matters and looking for help from others also matters, okay? So, so try to take these things and try to put them in action. It's a lot of information, 
do a little bit. Um, take something that sort of hit you and think, oh yeah, I can use that. Take that and start with it. Then once it feels like you've really got that, then you might start to add or incorporate other things, okay? But uh, again, as much as, I, as much as I can stress, move from just having information to actually acting on the information. All right. Thank you so much for your attention and, and your time. I don't know if uh, anybody's got any more questions, if there are any comments from the presenters at this point, no? Okay. Okay, I'm just going to say thank you to the three of you, uh, Dave, Tiffany, and Laura. Thank you very much for your time and for um, all of your patience and for your, um, you know, engagement and being with us tonight. I will just remind you that we do have a handout that we're going to send out by email. Well, it'll also come with a feedback form. We would love your feedback uh, about how we make this better. We we do take that to heart and uh, we continue to adapt it. Um, we also want to just really briefly highlight our support group. So Parents for Children's Mental Health has support groups. Um, on the third Wednesday of each month, we have an ADHD support group. And on the fourth Tuesday of each month, we have um, a mental health, uh, essentially a general mental health or behavior challenges kind of um, support group that you're welcome to um, virtually join us on. To register for those, you go to or you email our Waterloo at PCM h.ca um, to sign up for those which is probably the email that you've been uh, using to register as well um, and so uh, those will be coming up where I'm not sure whether we'll be hosting those in December just given the holidays but certainly again in January we'll be running those again so anyway again thank you very much for uh, your time and your engagement tonight and we wish you all the best with your parenting thank you <laughs>